Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. This is Matt Lynch. I'm coming to you from Cheltenham in the UK. Cheltenham is home of uh, the Gold Cup and horse racing and the government communications headquarters and, more importantly, Westminster Theological Center, at least our head offices, which is where I work and I lecture in Old Testament. I'm co-host of the podcast with Matt Bates, who lectures in New Testament at Quincy University in Illinois, and Drew Johnson, who teaches biblical and theological studies at the King's College in New York City, but he's currently at the Lagos Institute in St. Andrews, Scotland, where they are busy pondering some of the deepest and most profound questions to ever face humanity. And uh, why are they pondering those questions, you ask? Well, it's because it's too dark, cold, and rainy to do anything else. Before we begin today, I want to offer a special word of thanks to Ed Hackey, who produces the show. Uh, He's done a superb job, and let's face it, we don't always give him the best audio, uh, but he makes delicious lemonade out of what are often um, our uh, audio lemons that we send to him. So thank you so much, Ed, for all that you do uh, for this podcast. It's much better because of you. Okay, Matt Bates is helming this episode, and he's on with Mike Bird. so I hope you enjoy it. It is believed that Seneca the Younger, writing in approximately 55 AD, composed a biting political satire called The Pumpkinification of Claudius. We aren't totally sure who wrote it, because joking about the emperor being transformed into a pumpkin was not exactly a safe thing to do, even if you were already in political exile and the emperor in question was dead. Seneca's purpose was to poke fun at the idea that emperors could become gods upon death. He suggested it might be equally reasonable to say that they could become pumpkins. One of the characters in the pump- pumpkinification satire even says, quote, At one time it was a great thing to be made a god, but now you have made the distinction a farce, end quote. And he continues, quote, I propose that from this day onwards no one shall be made a god from those who eat the fruits of the earth or whom the fruitful earth nourishes, end quote. Hello, OnScript listeners. We've got an exciting episode for you today. I'm Matthew Bates, one of OnScript's regular hosts. My other co-hosts, Matt Lynch and Drew Johnson, are present here with me too. That is, they are present with me in spirit, as they're not present bodily, nor are they presently attached to any microphones or recording devices. I'm hosting solo, uh, but I prefer to believe that I am never entirely solo. And our special guest for OnScript today is, drumroll please, none other than the famous, infamous Australian New Testament scholar, Michael Bird. Mike's got a new book out that should be of particular interest to our listeners, Jesus, the Eternal Son, Answering Adoptionist Christology, published by Erdman's uh, just out this year. Plus, he has a cool Australian accent. Welcome to OnScript, Mike. G'day, Matt. Great to be with you. All right, Mike, I've met you in person for a 10-minute conversation at SBL, but I can't say I really know you yet. So let's begin. Yeah, let's begin um, with a huge philosophical question then, Mike. So who, Mike, are you at the very core of your being? Who or what is Michael Bird? Uh, Michael Bird is just your average Aussie uh, trying to make his way in the world, serving God and raising a family. Well, that's a that's a pretty good uh, quick answer. I'll give you credit for that. Uh, I think that there's probably a lot more complexity and depth we could probe there, and uh, maybe we'll get a chance. Well, at, at, at my college, I run the postgraduate program, so they call me the czar of postgraduistan. Uh, so that's maybe maybe that's another way you could call me the czar of postgraduistan. The czar of postgraduistan. Well, you know, um, I, that seems fitting. Uh, you're also, you know, the guru of, of writing, as you've written or edited some 30 books. And in fact, Mike, is that a, a book I hear you typing right now in the background? Are you are you are you click are you clicking away back there, Mike? Is that what I hear? No, no, no. I'm, I'm not that bored. If if I get really bored <laughs> during the conversation, I'll start tweeting. 
<laughs> okay, good. Um, and actually, you, you mentioned that you're on you're on holiday right now. Yes, yes. I'm in uh, regional New South Wales in a place called Tamworth, which is uh, uh, probably the best explained as the Nashville of Australia. It's a country music centre, uh, a regional a regional capital in a, in, in Australia. So, uh, like, a, just a very big, not not quite a city, but a bit, bit bigger than a country town. All right, well, uh, circling around to the topic here that we're going to discuss mostly is your book, Jesus, the Eternal Son. What led you to write this particular book? Uh, a number of things. Uh, I was involved in a, with a, in a debate with Bart uh, Ehrman about early Christology, and, and you, know, you know, Ehrman had a, had a book come out called how Jesus became God, and I teamed up with a no- number of scholars, including Simon Gathercole, Craig Evans, Charles Hill, and Chris Tilling, and we did our own little book in Counterpoint called How, G- uh, how God Became Jesus. And uh, it, was, it was sort of out of the debates we had that book, and I, I did an event with um, uh, Ehrman in New Orleans, and I, I, one area of his book I really wanted to engage was his view that the earliest Christology of the church was something along the lines of an adoptionist or an exaltationist Christology, which is basically the idea that Jesus became a God, was declared a God or made a God, it's you know, various permutations, uh, at some point. And that was either at his uh, resurrection, uh, some would say his baptism, and then some later would say his, his birth, and then only later was it in any pre-existent sense. So I wanted to quickly, quickly engage that view because it's a view that, that, that pops up here and there and some people tell a story of Christian origins as if that was indeed the earliest Christology. And what I found striking is that I don't really think that view properly emerges till the end of the second century. So I, I don't think adoptionism was the earliest Christology. Yeah, um, I think that uh, you certainly have a, a forceful and uh, compelling presentation, I think, in that direction. Obviously, it's, it's something that connects to my own research interests as well. And uh, and for those who are not perhaps up to speed on their Christology, um, you know, so the orthodox uh, view or the mainstream view within the church uh, is, of course, that Jesus is the eternal son, that he has always been God's son. Yeah, and that uh, this adoptionist Christology then, um, at least according to orthodoxy as that emerged, um, but uh, um, but Mike and others are arguing uh, that, in fact, it's, it was always the case that uh, that Jesus was the eternal son, and adoptionism only emerged uh, much later in history, uh, but that when it did emerge, it, it argued that Jesus uh, uh, was someone who was uh, um, someone who was adopted at a specific point in time as God's son, but not eternally the son. Um well, let me uh, say a couple more words about you, Mike, as I as I, I pulled some interesting information uh, on you uh, from the Internet here. Uh, and uh, and then we'll circle back to your book uh, and dive in a bit further. Um, so uh, Michael grew up in Brisbane before joining the Army and serving as a paratrooper, intelligence operator and then a chaplain's assistant. And it was during this time in the military that he came to faith from a non-Christian background. He completed his Ph.D. at the University of Queensland and he's taught Uh, at Highland Theological College uh, and then the Brisbane School of Theology in Australia. Uh, And then he joined the faculty at Ridley as a lecturer in theology in 2013. That's the post he currently holds. Uh, He's also the co-editor of a whole bunch of uh, commentary series and runs a popular blog called Evangelion. Um, and I would say my personal favorite Mike Bird book is The Saving Righteousness of God. Yeah, thanks. Uh, which, yeah, which was, uh, you know, certainly uh, it's a more scholarly book, I, I would say, uh, as he's done stuff that's on the, the, the much more kind of academic end and stuff on the more popular academic end. Uh, and then I also really like uh, your, your more whimsical introducing Paul, and I regularly feed a portion of that to my undergrads. Uh, so... Yes, so the, so that's a nice one too. But I, I the book under discussion might be my new favorite. I have to say, Jesus the Eternal Son. Um, now, uh, what I really want to know, then, in light of your story, is you know how does uh, how did this book specifically emerge? You know, out of your career as an army paratrooper and intelligence officer, um, I'm sure there must be a connection. Uh, only by the virtue of the fact that the uh, the same the same person who is the theologian and the paratrooper but that is quite literally the the only link there is between them. <laughs> um, 
yeah, it, it is hard to it is hard to sort of connect these uh, these disparate portions of our life, right? As I used to be an electrical engineer, I used to be an electrical engineer, and people are like, "What? Like, how could you become a move from there to being a theologian?" But uh, you know, I, I think I think you've you've made an even further uh, journey than I have, my paratrooper and intelligence officer. Right, so, uh, what's the principal reason then, in your judgment, why a few of uh, a few of our scholars in New Testament studies and Christian origins? Um, uh, Jimmy Dunn, Bart Ehrman, Michael Papard, and others hold that the earliest Christology was in fact adoptionist. What's the sort of evidence that they're marshalling or or the case that uh, is being put forward? You might speak of the classic case of Dunn or the more recent contribution of Ehrman then. Well, I think that there are there are some texts where you could uh, get an, get an inkling that these could be read in an adoptionist direction. Uh, for example, a text like Romans chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, a, a text that you know, you've written on yourself, uh, Matt, uh, you know, you can understand why some people might think that that implies an adoptionism where Jesus is declared the Son of God and in power by his resurrection from the dead. Or if you look at the baptism story in the Gospel of Mark where there's this voice from heaven that says when Jesus comes out of the water, you know, this is my son. I mean, if you, if you take those passages, you know, alone, in isolation from their context, uh, you, you could well uh, at least imagine or think that these imply an adoptionist Christology. So I think that's one thing. There are some, there are some texts that could give weight or credence to that view. Now, I'll, I'll contest the validity of those readings, but we can at least grant where, where people are coming from. The other thing I think drives this is is there's often a view that Christology evolved from something like adoptionism to incarnationalism, and it was you know a fairly steady and gradual process from from one point to another. So I think that's that's largely the drivers behind this. Yeah, there's certainly a. It was certainly a trend in New Testament studies. I don't know if it's quite gone away or toward the developmentalism of all things, right? As uh, everything wanted to be able to, uh, you wanted to be able to trace out a line of uh, progress or whatever it might be in various kinds of doctrines. Um, so I think that you're right um, uh, in in saying that uh, the Apostle Paul's view then is a ground zero of sorts. I think that's the language you use in your, your book or maybe the epicenter. You know, uh, as uh, if you're going to make a case for something that develops, obviously um, you need to show that um, that Paul is not an obstacle to your thesis, right? Uh, and this is uh, important in the the, uh, the discussion here of adoptionism because if it's not the case that Paul was an adoptionist, right, but he had some other view, well then the whole the whole scheme may collapse, right? As Paul is our earliest Christian writer. So um, you, I think, rightly focus quite a bit of attention on um, the case in uh, Paul's letters uh, that have been made by those who are saying this is adoptionist and saying not so fast. Uh, and arguably, Romans 1, 3 through 4, then, is uh, perhaps the most important side of debate. I'm going to go ahead and read that just in you know, a popular English translation, and then maybe we can talk about it a little bit more. But uh, uh, this is from the, the New Revised Standard Version, then, uh, Romans 1, 3. The gospel concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So where is it that uh, that folks are finding adoptionism in that Romans 1, 3 through 4 uh, text? And, and wh where do you want to press and say, I don't think that's quite right? Well, I think some scholars would say the line declared to be the son of God in power by resurrection from the dead would indicate in their mind that Jesus became the son upon his resurrection. And that then would kind of dovetail with a type of, you know, um, ancient view of apotheosis where, where someone dies and, you know, becomes uh, divine in some way. So that, that's where they're coming from. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to contest that reading on two grounds. Uh, number one, I think I don't think it's a I don't think it's a change from non sonship to divine sonship. If you read that short little statement, and it could be like an early creed or a bit of prose based on primitive tradition that Paul is citing, it seems that there is a two stage movement, but it's not from non sonship to divine sonship, but rather Jesus, Jesus goes from being the son of David, which is which is you know a, a divine son. He is the you know the, the 
the, the Israel's king is a son of God. You, know, you get that from Psalm 2 and 2 Samuel 7. So Jesus goes from being, if you like, the messianic son of God to the heavenly enthroned son of God. So I would say that a divine sonship is transposed rather than triggered by the event of resurrection. In other words, Jesus is already the son of God by virtue of being from the seed of David, being from the Davidic line. He is the Davidic son of God, but he then becomes the son of God enthroned at the father's right hand by virtue of resurrection. So that's that's one thing I would say. Uh, the other thing I would point out is when people want to point out the uh, analogy with Greco-Roman views of deification, I, I can't help but uh, uh, indicate to them that there is one strange dissimilarity. When, some, when an emperor, like, say, Julius Caesar or a Claudius or a, a Vespasian or whoever it was, when they die and they become deified, they don't become the Son of God. They become divine. It's their adopted heir who is left behind, who is very much alive, who becomes the son of the divine Julius, or son of the divine Augustus, or son of the divine Vespasian, or whatever it is. So nobody becomes a son of God by virtue of, of death and apotheosis. It's the heir left behind. So the parallel with between what Jesus experiences and Greco-Roman deification is inexact. So that's how I would explain Romans one. It's a state. It's a it's a change, not from non-sonship to divine sonship, but rather from a Davidic divine sonship to a more heavenly or majestic divine sonship. And I don't think the analog with Greco-Roman deification really holds. Yeah, I appreciate both of those points, especially the second point was something that I hadn't uh, thought through very much. And uh, it was helpful for me, the idea that it um, is, is something that isn't really fitting for um, uh, for the son, right, uh, in the in the emperor context. Um, yeah. And the, and the other point about it being, you know, sort of the, 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 um, the seed of David and uh, that language there, um, I would I would take it in a very slightly different ways, although uh, way, although I think that um, uh, that our views are very compatible. I, I do like that the language of the two uh It does seem like this uh, c- this coming into being language and, and then the experimentos dowie maybe by means of the son of David, perhaps even as a reference to Mary. Um, I, 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 yeah, there's different ways people have, have, have put that together. Ulrich Wil- Vilkins and some others have, have argued in that direction, too. Nevertheless, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but uh, it, there, there's some interesting parallels in Galatians 4, you know, with a, with a, you know, um, with a, with a woman. Listeners should uh, definitely consult some of your own work on that, that text as well. The article you had in CBQ and uh, I think was it something in your, was it your doctoral thesis as well? Something in there? Um, in I yes I do some of it in uh, yeah my my hermeneutics book and uh, yeah and then the CBQ article was sort of a follow up to some of that yes uh huh yeah uh, but anyway it's a, an ongoing scholarly conversation I think uh, Mike's way of reading this text and mine are in general very compatible as I think would be united in the idea that this induname this uh, this by power language you know is uh, attached or is uh, uh, or in power is attached to the Son of God as a title in some way not as uh, uh, not as something else uh, so that there's an idea of a, a, a pre-existent sonship in some in some sense that's qualified by the the new title or the new office Son of God in power. Um, yeah, so it's that that I think is sort of ground zero. The other text that's been so important, it seems like, uh, to those who would favor an adoptionist reading uh, would be Peter's Pentecost speech uh, in Acts chapter two. Right. Um, and uh, that that passage reads as follows here. I'm just taking this extracted from your own translation in your book uh, where it says uh, 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 this would be Acts 236. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know most assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Well, and and, and someone who's uh, on the adoptionist side of the argument here might be like, well, here we have it, don't we? It was only after the resurrection that God made Jesus the Lord and the Messiah, which must mean that he was adopted as Messiah only after his resurrection, right? Um, so uh, then, uh, again, why do we need to say the adoptionist? I'm not so sure that uh, you're, you're following the evidence in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, that whole, uh, that if you take that verse by itself, again, you could understand where people propagating an adoptionist view are coming from. But once you look at that speech in its wider context, 
it becomes very apparent that adoptionism would be completely incompatible with what Peter, according to Luke, is speaking about. I mean, for a start, there seems to be at least a tacit form of pre-existence there with the, I believe, the use with Psalm 110, something I think, you know, I think you've talked about there with the, uh, what's it, prosopological exegesis sort of going on there. Yes, yes, that dreadful term. Yes, yes, where you've you've got where you've got kind of you know um, Jesus, you know, pre-existent Jesus speaking in Scripture. Uh, you've also got this 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 depiction of Jesus as the dispenser of the Spirit. Now, as far as I can tell, in the Old Testament and in Second Temple Jewish literature, the only person who dispenses the Spirit is Yahweh, is the is the Kurios, and yet that role is being attributed to Jesus. What we have then declared in Acts 2.36 is not the statement of some sort of adoptionist Christology, but rather it seems to be the divine verdict that irrespective of what the Romans or the Judean leadership did to him, God has reversed it by raising him from the dead, exalting him to his right hand, which is the concrete proof that he's not a messianic pretender, he was not a false prophet, he is in fact the messianic leader, and he is the Lord of the people of God. So it's it's a real kind of in your face to the powers that be that God has undone what they did to Jesus. Oh, very good. I, I think you make a helpful distinction too when you um, you kind of break apart Luke's different ideas of the stages of messiahship. That uh, wh- whenever Jesus is, you know, at his baptism, you know, this is when he's being anointed as Messiah, uh, you know, and that he's being designated in some way as the Messiah, and that we don't have to um, we don't have to talk about his messiahship as if it happened all at once. So whenever we say that. Uh, he was made both Lord and Messiah. This would refer to his installation as the king, right? You can be, you can be appointed the king, but you may not actually begin to rule yet until you you actually attain to your your office fully. Exactly. I think those distinctions really do clarify what's happening across Luke Acts. All right, Mike. Well, I have built into your your uh, uh, the, uh, this conversation here a couple speed rounds just to sort of break things up. And the idea with these speed rounds is that. Uh, you don't get to defend your answer. I'm just going to ask you a question, and you just tell me whatever comes into your mind. Uh, and so this is obviously sets you up for all kinds of awkward things later, as uh, people can say, I can't believe you said that. So some of them probe more serious issues. Some of them are just for kicks and just fun. Um, so uh, so l- let's give it a whirl. And the idea is, you know, no no answer should take more than 20 seconds or so. You ready? Okay, bring it on. Okay. Uh, what's a trend in society that scares you? Uh, we have a therapy-based culture. Everything is about feeling good and not feeling bad. You walk up to the bartender and you order what? I order a Pinot Noir. Mm. Pinot Noir. Very good. Uh, what's the most important theology or biblical studies book of the last 50 years? Uh, N.T. writes Jesus and the Victory of God. Oh, wow. I think you're the first one who said that, but um, th- there's been a... There's been a, a, a number of people who have just not been able to answer that question. They just they just they, they ponder it. They just I just can't I just can't narrow down. Oh, that, that that book was revolutionary for me. That's the that was the moment I left the Matrix. Uh, I think it was for me too. Actually, it was certainly. But I mean, I read New Testament and the People of God first. But Jesus and the Victory of God has has certainly been the best book on the best single book on Jesus that I've ever read. I would say. Yeah, so, I agree. Um, yeah, it, it is. It it, it 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 moved me out of the matrix too. I would say, but I read the Challenge of Jesus first. Um, actually, that was the the book that really got me hooked on biblical studies and made me go like, wow. Uh, a lot of things I thought I knew. I've read the gospel so many times. I just don't know. I didn't. You know, it it sort of blew my mind. And uh, and then then I got more and more into right. Uh, so huh, good good choice. Uh, what's something you find embarrassing, Mike? Something I find embarrassing. Oh dear. Um, oh, wearing braces as a 40-year-old man. Ah, yes, yes. Lots of awkward questions about that, huh? Yeah, my, my, my teeth are, my, my teeth are, for most of my life have been more crooked than a um, Democrat sen- senator from Delaware. So I've had some <laughs> finally getting my teeth fixed and uh, hopefully braces, braces should be off by end of the year. 
Yeah, well, don't be embarrassed about it. Be be glad you were able to do it. Uh, but what you should be embarrassed about, Mike, is if after you got your braces, if you let them regress. Now, wear your retainer. Um, your orthodontist will tell you the same thing, and so will I, because, you know, as a, a privileged teenager, I had braces, and then, of course, you know, didn't wear my retainer, and now my teeth are probably every bit as crooked or worse as when I started. So don't be like me. Um, all right, you ready for another one? Do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe in ghosts? Only the Holy Ghost. <laughs> all right, well, that's the first speed round. Good. Um, all right, so back to uh, back to the book. Um, now, if Paul's ground zero, then uh, when we go beyond Paul, obviously our other early texts in the New Testament are going to be very important for the conversation here, the Gospel of Mark. And depending on where you date Hebrews, Hebrews would be very important here. I would favor an earlier date for Hebrews than some other of my colleagues. But um, but uh, Gospel of Mark then has really been, you know, um, uh, a point of contention and in this ongoing thing. So can you give us a, a, a little update on um, the scholarly conversations that have been happening around Mark and Christology and maybe begin to locate your own project? So you have Jesus gets baptized in the Gospel of Mark and there's a voice says, this is my son, that type of thing. And people go, aha, you see, this is the point where Jesus becomes the son of God, the voice from heaven, announces that he is at this point and only at this point become the divine son and given that you know mark's gospel is a little bit more subdued say in comparison to the gospel of john or something like the christ hymn of philippians and and the the, the famous bit of prose in colossians one yeah again you could understand how people could take that in the adoption of sense and uh one scholar michael papard uh, american scholar has written a, a book about the son of god in the greco-roman world and I think he has done a reasonable case to say that some people who were, say, immersed in Greco-Roman views of deification of emperors and and you know adoption as a as a social practice in their in their own setting, I think they could indeed read Mark as uh, Mark one uh, as a as an adoptionist story because uh, you know reading is a matter of context. If your context is adoptionism, if your if, if your context is Greco-Roman deifications and that type of thing, you, you, you could understand that. Uh, and while that may be meaningful or that may be the resonance that Mark 1 would have with certain readers immersed in that type of culture, I don't think it maps internally as to what happens in the rest of the Markan narrative. Now, I can, I can demonstrate a few ways. Okay, for a start, what we have in Mark 1 is not so much the beginning of Jesus' sonship, but more properly what Mark regards as the beginning of the gospel. I mean, it's very interesting. You've got John the Baptist talking about, you know, how he's on the scene in the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord. And then the guy who steps onto the, the, the scene next is none other than Jesus. So you get the, the impression that Jesus is the kurios, Jesus is the Lord, whom John the Baptist has been sent to prepare. And indeed, if you look at the kurios language, across the Gospel of Mark, uh, the indication we get is that Kurios seems to be split between the God of Israel and Jesus. And you see that in a number of places. In, uh, in uh, I believe it's Mark chapter 10, you've got that famous statement where Jesus affirms the Shema of Deuteronomy 6, you know, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And yet soon after, Jesus poses a question to the scribes as to how the Messiah can be the son of David when David, presumably speaking in Psalm 110, calls him Lord. And that seems to be fostering the idea that the Messiah might be a son of David, but he's more than a son of David. He is also the Kurios, he is also the Lord. And then we could look at the end of Mark's Gospel where Jesus is before Caiaphas and Caiaphas uh, asks him if he is the son of the Blessed One, and Jesus responds with an answer that conflates Daniel 7.13 and Psalm 110, which refers to a figure, both texts there refer to a figure, who is seated beside Yahweh, not on a separate throne, but on God's very own throne, and uh, who seems to be sort of um, exalted as God's vice region. So this kurios language across the Gospel of Mark is quite evident that Jesus is more than a human being who is made or declared God's son. And added to that, we get indications of pre-existence, I think, in 
Mark's gospel. I've always found it very interesting that the demons who who were, who were doing the rounds they always say to, about Jesus, you know, I know who you are, the the Holy One of God. We know who you are, the Son of God. I mean, how did the demons know that Jesus is the Son of God? Was one of them at the baptism scene and you know put it on kind of the um, demonic version of Reddit or something or did demonic Twitter? Uh, what was going on? How do they know he's the son of God? Most likely because they know that the son, like them, uh, uh, are somewhat heavenly, earthly, supernatural beings. And the other thing I would add, why it doesn't make sense to call the baptism scene in Mark's gospel an adoption scene, is because three times Jesus is called the son of God. You know, at his baptism, there is the voice from heaven. But then at the transfiguration, we have the same thing again. You know, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. It's more emphatic. Uh, does Jesus get adopted again a second time at the transfiguration? And then at the cross, we have a Roman centurion who says, surely this man was the son of God. Is uh, Do we have three adoptions of Jesus in the Gospel of John? Because if a, if a, a voice that announces Jesus' sonship is an adoption, it would implicate that Jesus gets adopted an amazing three times, which I simply don't think uh, is what Mark is getting at. So therefore, I think we would be more likely to infer in light of the texture and claims in Mark's gospel that Jesus' baptism is, seems to be more of a, of a public beginning or a public commission of his role to be the messianic son and the Isianic servant, if you like. So that's how I would explain and and uh, go through Mark's baptism story. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think um, a couple things come to mind here. Um, I think, is it Richard Hayes who calls Mark's Christology reticent? Um, I think see the language that seems to stick in my mind that I think he was using, you know, that uh, it's certainly a high Christology, um, but uh, he... Um, he wants to paint his narrative in in ways that will allow that to emerge uh, rather than being overt about it. Um, yeah, and I, I like how you um, you um, I actually had had a separate question about um, Papard's uh, uh, thesis, you know, of um, of adoption, and I liked how you you uh, explained that a little bit for us. Um, yeah, there's some interesting things he's doing there, right? As I think uh, he does, as you say, show ways in which it might resonate within the the, the Roman culture of the time period. But uh, there's also some places that seem a little bit iffy. There's um, you know some like he wants to sort of argue that the the dove of the baptism is somehow a, ca- a counter imperial symbol to the Roman eagle. Is that right? Yeah, well, Pepard's book has a num- a numerous discernible strengths. One of the biggest weaknesses, and I think other reviewers have picked this up on as well, is he really has to downplay the Old Testament echoes and allusions and get his sort of, you know, um, background intertext from other places. And, I mean, the problem is, in my mind, Mark's gospel is just so full of intertextual echoes of the Old Testament. You know, whether we talk about citation, allusion, and echo. And we know very confidently that, that for Mark, the Old Testament really does seem to be driving a, a lot about what he's configuring of the story of Jesus, the claims he makes about Jesus. And while this certainly uh, can be situated within the Greco-Roman world as well, uh, I think the primary intertext for understanding Mark's gospel has got to be, it's got to be the Old Testament, principally the, the, the many of the Psalms and the book of Isaiah. Yeah, you're right. I think that um, one of my mentors, Ricky Watts, you know, um, who is back in Australia, I believe now, uh, as he was at Regent College whenever I was uh, with him. Uh, but I think that he, uh, you know, is uh, an expert on Mark's use of the Old Testament. And I think he, I want to say he counted 69 Old Testament quotations or allusions whenever he was writing his, his commentary on Mark's use of the Old Testament. And so we have such firm evidence, right, that Mark is using Old Testament allusions. Uh, we, we don't really have any evidence he's countering, you know, Roman imperial claims. So it sort of uh, becomes quite a, quite a stretch, I think, to say that that's the primary background which, against which we're to read it rather than the Old Testament. Yeah, I think that's that's very well done. Yeah, and um, 
yeah, there was there's some other moves that are made, you know, the sort of the, the Roman genius slash Newman, you know, and equating that to spirit and, and various things that I think were going on with uh, Papard uh, in his thesis. But I, I think you're right. I think he does show some interesting things uh, at the end of the day about how it might have resonated with a Roman audience uh, that I wouldn't have been attuned to otherwise. And so it's very helpful in that regard, even if I don't follow the adoptionist conclusion. Um, yeah. Um, let me look at let me look uh and see what i what i had next for you here as uh as uh, we actually jumped into we had a, several questions that we combined i wanted to ask you a separate question about the transfiguration but you were all over that uh as uh, i think you're right that uh that uh idea that uh, he would be adopted twice uh if we have the transfiguration language uh is uh, a real problem for the adoptionist thesis uh how about how about we then move toward the end of the story um uh as you know, we've been sort of looking at the idea of uh, adoptionist Christology, and certainly we would want to say that as time goes on, there were Christians who were adoptionist. We just don't have any evidence they were the earliest Christians. Where do we finally see this emerge then? Well, let me first of all tell you where I don't think we see it. I don't think we see it in the Ebionites. It seems to be this, this scholarly myth that the Ebionites, a, Jew, a Jewish Christian group in the second century, were adoptionist. And I have no, I'm not too sure where this came from because the early sources I've read do not indicate that they were adoptionist. Um, our earliest account of the Ebionites comes from Irenaeus, who's writing around about the 180s. And what he attributes to them seems to be more of a possession Christology, kind of like, you know, the Christ came upon the man Jesus and sort of, you know, possessed him or overpowered him. But it's, it's never... A, related to divine sonship or adoptionist. Uh, Epiphanius, writing in the in the late 4th century, um, I mean, he has a lot about the Ebionites as well, but his account is very muddled. I mean, he thinks there really was a dude called Ebion uh, who went to Rome and promulgated this heresy there, which is why you get adoptionists in Rome. And I, and I, I mean, his account is somewhat muddled and ambiguous. Some elements of it could imply a, a kind of adoption, if you like, but he's our least reliable source. So th if the Ebionites are taken out of the equation, and I, and I think they are, they've got, a, they've got more of a possession Christology or something like that, according to Irenaeus, I think it's with a group of the Theodosians uh, in Rome in the late 2nd century, sometime around the 190s, uh, I think those are the people who seem to be advocating the first full Monty bona fide real adoptionist. Christology. Yeah, um, and uh, uh, it gets a little confusing with uh, the Theodotus. We we have uh, don't we have more than one? We have one that's a cobbler and one that's uh, one's a banker. Uh, you, you expand on that a little bit. I, I I've read all this before, but it's been a little bit while, and it's uh, it's not at the top of my brain. I mean, I'm hoping it's at the top of yours. So uh, when we finally see it, how's it articulated, and who are the major players here? Well, you, you do get this one chap called Theodosius, the the leather worker. Uh, and and he seems to view Jesus more as a mere man or a prophet possessed by the Spirit. Um, nothing explicitly there, I think, would be adoptionist. But then it's then the movement kind of splits up, and there's one group that really do think Jesus became the Son of God at his resurrection. That's where he was kind of promoted to divine honors. And there's a good chance that uh, they were influenced by, you know, maybe seeing the the deification of a of a one of the emperors like you know Pertinax, who was believed to um, been granted celestial honors at his death. They may have been influenced by the philosopher Galen, who around at the time and his some sort of philosophy as well. So that, that's as far as we know that the first first real uh, I think authentic adoptionists are the Theodosians. Anything before that. The evidence is either not there or it's a little bit more ambiguous and murky. Yeah, and then as as time goes on, it gets picked up by Paul Samosana and some others. Wow. As well. Exactly. Um, so there's a, uh, and then we end up with a, you know, this becoming part of the ongoing sort of Trinitarian discourse with Nicaea uh, is partly closing off the adoptionist option as being uh, contrary to Scripture and contrary to uh, the apostolic tradition. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, uh, it's uh, certainly a, a, a much less wild tale, right, uh, if we end up uh, saying that uh, adoptionist Christology emerges in the late second century than it was actually what the earliest Christians believed. Uh, that's not going to make the front page of the New York Times. Um, I mean, yes. in my view, there's, there's, there's no doubt that there, was a, that there was a development in Christology. I mean, you know, 10 minutes after Pentecost, people were not walking around with the Nicene Creed had been magically downloaded into their head. Uh, there was some diversity, there was indeed debate. I mean, you've only got to look at, say, the epistles of John or, or some of the other elements of the New Testament to say that some people were taking their devotion to Jesus in different directions. So um, I wouldn't deny that there was some development and there was debate and there was diversity. But as far as we can tell, amidst those debates, amidst, those, amidst that diversity, we don't really have any adoptionism arising until the second century. And my explanation for that is, you know, as, as, your, as your context becomes more Hellenistic and more philosophical, if you've got a view that God's being can have no becoming, in other words, something that's authentically divine cannot change, it cannot become human, then obviously you're going to have to have some other way of explaining Jesus' divinity uh, r rather than the sort of, sort of you know, pre-existence to, to incarnation, that sort of a thing. So, yeah, that, that's, that's what I think is, is going on in, in the early church. And that's why I think we, we don't get the adoptionism emerging till you know, relatively late on the scene. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's not a sexy story, but uh, it's the true one, which is probably sexy enough for me uh, and, uh, and for, for you as well. Uh, as as I think that, uh, you know, uh, those who are scholars in Christian origins, at least uh, of a certain stripe, some of them really would like to, to grab uh, front page headlines uh, with uh, some new narrative about how this all unfolded. Right. Oh, uh, indeed. Uh, indeed. Yeah. Most, most of the time, the narrative is not true, unfortunately. Um, uh, and uh, that, that doesn't exactly make uh, front page news. Um, how about how about we do another speed round just for fun uh, as I've got another one in there and then I've got a couple of uh, wrap up questions for you. Ready? Okay, I'm ready. All right, so uh, what's one widespread idea in the field of New Testament studies or Christian origins that needs to die? Oh, boy. Um, widespread idea that needs to die. Yeah, it's just it's just served its its purpose, its course. It was never true in the first place or whatever it might be, but this this idea needs to go away. Okay, I think, I think that's easy that... that, uh, that Je Jesus was a Baptist and Paul was Protestant. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, uh, Mike, are you willing to sing a song for me right now on the spot? Oh, I, I could probably, I could probably do a bit of Hamilton. You know. All right. Let's hear it. After yeah, let's the hear war, it. I went back to New York. I finished up my studies and I practiced law. I practiced law, but work next door, or work next door. All right. <laughs> That's good. You're uh, you're one of only two that I've interviewed who have been willing to sing for me. Uh, I got a nice rendition of uh, "Amazing Grace" uh, out of uh, out of um, Ord. Uh, he he sang a little "Amazing Grace" for me. My wife took out a court order to prevent me singing in public, but since this is an America principle, uh, I guess I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if you're in the if you're in the Australian country music capital of the world, uh, it sounded like that Hamilton bit was a bit of rap. I, uh, you should have sung me some Australian country. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so wrong. <laughs> yeah, just, 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 just imagine Ted Nugent meets you, Jackman. Just imagine that. <laughs> All right, are you ready? The scariest thing about growing older is? Uh, your body breaks down and you do not have the same abilities as when you were younger. All right, do you dance to the radio at home when nobody is looking, Mike? No, I do not. If you're at my house for dinner, what's the one thing you're hoping that I don't serve you? Cannabis-flavored tofu. Ooh. Yeah, that, that's... Is that a thing? Uh, only in Portland. <laughs> yeah, my wife is from Portland. Uh, their, their motto in the city is, keep Portland weird, and they are succeeding. They are, I know, yeah, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> they are succeeding. Uh, if you were to complete a PhD in a field outside of theology, history, or religion, what would it be in? Law. Law. Interesting. Huh. Ooh. 
Wow, I might have to probe that in an SBL conversation down the road. That's interesting. All right, uh, do you have any do you have any recommend, recommendations for further reading for those who want to probe Christological origins further? Now, apart from your book, you know, Jesus the Eternal Son, which uh, I'm hoping everyone rushes out to buy. Uh, anything that you think is particularly compelling out there right now on Christ, oh, well, Christological origins? There's, there's, there's some really good classic books. I think you know Richard Balcom's book, um, God Crucified. Uh, Larry Hurtado's The Lord Jesus Christ. I think those are really awesome volumes. Uh, Martin Hengel's book also sure. on the Son of God. I think that is also a, a superb volume. And, I mean, Martin Hengel was such a master of the primary sources. And he could take all those German theories that came from Harnack and Bortmann and, you know, uh, Bousset and all those, and he could just break them down in a way that was, quite frankly, you, you were left wondering why they even gained prominence in the first place. So, yeah, they're the ones I'd recommend. Yeah, that's a, those are some great recommendations, some classics for sure. Um, well, I think we're, we're going to be able to take the importance of your argument for scholars for granted. I think all scholars are going to be interested in this book, and uh, I'm hoping that it's of interest to uh, those who are in a more pastoral or in a lay environment. Uh, how about we speak then to the lay audience? Um, why should just the ordinary Christian in the pew care about this book in any way? Should they care in any way? Well, I would say one of the most important questions one person can ever ask is, who is Jesus? And that is also a question that's, that, that gets asked in the academy. It gets asked in churches and in various religious communities and organization. And it's a question, ultimately, you have to ask of yourself. Who do you think Jesus is? Is he simply a human being uh, who was a great teacher? Was he a prophet? Was he you know, an angel? Uh, who do you say he is? And for those who want an understanding of Jesus informed by the New Testament, uh, I think the answer in the negative is not that he was a human being who got adopted. He wasn't, he wasn't elevated to divine status beyond his merit. He was the Son of God who became flesh, who became fle flesh for us, who suffered, died, and rose from the dead and has been exalted to the right hand of the Father. The other reason why I think uh, adoptionist Christology uh, makes a difference is because it, it promotes a narrative of something of a theology of works and um, I, I know one chapter, I, one guy I cite at the end of the book I think it's um, Yasto Gonzalez, uh, he points out that the adoptionism becomes this idea of like local boy who makes good that you know by merit work you can, you can make it all the way on the steam of your own effort and, 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 it, and it, it sort of promulgates the idea that you know we, we, we can all live our own dream if we work hard enough we believe in ourselves we too can get to the goal the status you know whatever it is that we want that prize is there for us but it's but it's always by merit or by works so i think uh, an adoptionist christology is incongruent with the theology of of grace so i, th I think there's a, a view of salvation that comes out of that that christology that I, that identity of jesus so that's yeah, that's how I that's how I present it. No, yeah, that's really good, and you know I think uh, maybe some additional evidence in favor of a, a non-adoptionist Christology is that no one else gets adopted as divine within Christianity. You know, after Paul, with all of his labors, his heroic suffering, his you know suffering the forty lashes minus one five times, uh, how come he doesn't become a god? Right. Um, well, uh, you know, if if the narrative is apotheosis, right, of of you know, sort of earning your way to divine honors, um, why restrict it to Jesus within early Christianity? Um, how about then uh, when we switch over to the pulpit? Um, you, you know, you you have a, a pastor up there, and uh, he's been re he's been reading your book and has been informed in some way. Uh, what do you hope? Uh, what do you hope he's communicating? Uh, and uh, yeah, this is a, obviously a variation of the question that I just asked. Um, anything more you would want to add from a pastoral standpoint? Okay, I, th I think probably two things I'd want a pastor to do. I'd want him to have confidence and assurance that a, 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 a mature biblical theology will present Jesus as the eternal son who became human, not as a human being who became the divine son. So that's the first thing I want him to do. And, and you know, if he's got people in his congregation who have been reading a, a Bart Ehrman or watching some of the crazy clips you can get on YouTube or met some Unitarians or Jehovah's Witnesses, I would then hope that he would be able to impart to his congregation a very solid, 
robust biblical Christology of divine sonship. So that, that's, that's what I think he would do. And, you know, we, we confess that Jesus is the Son of God, uh, the eternal Son of God, not a human being made the Son of God. Wonderful. Um, well, we're, we're kind of wrap things up here. Um, I, I was wondering, though, surely you've got a current book project or four. Um, anything in the works you you, you want to drop you want to you want to drop uh, some topics on us and just give us a hint where you're going with your scholarship. The current thing I'm finishing up is a New Testament introduction, uh, co-authored with with N. T. Wright, and that's cool. that's been a good. And it's uh, it's partly me working my way through the Wrightonian corpus. And sort of developing some of Tom's materials and and adding and supplementing it and and, and various things to turn into it to, to that that you know that big corpus of writings that he's got so it can preferably be read in one lifetime rather than in several. <laughs> so uh, it's that's, that's that's really good and and um, and there's a fair bit of my own contribution in that and and I'm doing that in contribution uh, in, sorry in, in partnership with Tom and uh, he's been fantastic to to work with. And yeah, that's, that's the main thing I'm, I'm finishing up at the moment. I'm uh, currently in the Johannine epistles, uh, making my way towards uh, Revelation shortly after, then a few little things about text and canon, and then we'll, Lord willing, will all be done, and hopefully that'll hit the bookshelves in 2018, or sorry, more, more like 2019, to be honest. Uh-huh. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Yeah, I, I think that uh, all of us uh, in the field, or at least a great many of us, love N.T. Wright, but we also realize uh, his corpus is unwieldy, right? So you'll be doing a great service to everybody uh, as uh, as you as you as you slim that down, right? Uh, for uh, for consumption, that's a little um, a little more. Um, a little less bloated consumption. Let's put it that way. Uh, and sometimes, especially that said, it's not going to be a small book. We're looking at at least three hundred fifty thousand words. So it's um, it's, it's going to be a sizable book, but hopefully not not kind of pulled on the faithfulness of God. Be uh, yes. Well, that that's it's hard to outdo that uh, the fifteen hundred page wonder there. Yeah. Um. Good. Anything else? Uh, yet yeah, not. Oh, I've got to have a little book on on religious freedom coming out sometime soon. That's been a big issue in Australia. We're in the throes of a somewhat torrid and vitriolic and almost violent debate about same-sex marriage. We're currently having like a postal plebiscite on the topic to gauge the popula population's feelings on that subject, and uh, it has got nasty. So I've got a little book coming out on that uh, most likely sometime next year. And then I'm hoping to do a New Testament theology uh, for IVP, and then I'm going to do, want to do a couple of books on Second Peter and Jude. Ah, uh, see, I knew I knew you would have at least four. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're wonderfully prolific, Mike, and uh, we we do appreciate that. Actually, as uh, the, the more the merrier, right? As uh, as uh, as it gives us some more things to ponder. Um, well, it's been such a pleasure. We've really enjoyed. Well, thank you very you. much for having me, Matt. All right, this is your host, Matthew Bates, for On Script. Today's guest has been Michael Bird. We've been discussing Mike's outstanding book, Jesus, the Eternal Son, published by Ordinance in 2017. There's a link to the book on our website, onscript.study. It's been fun. And you, oh dear listeners, I am wishing you the very best. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate. 